hello, I extend a very warm welcome to everybody joining us for today's Bussola Institute webinar entitled Equality of Citizenship, the Opportunities and Challenges of Empowering Women During the Pandemic. The concept of uh, equality of citizenship is both, in my view, utterly simple and yet enormously complex. In its most straightforward sense, citizenship is about being a member of a community or a society that confers rights and responsibilities as a result of such membership. From a gender perspective, equality of citizenship confers equal rights and responsibilities on all women and men as citizens. However, citizenship is also an active concept going beyond a relationship between the citizen and the state. It extends to a range of other social institutions, such as the family, the household, traditional systems, uh, civil society, economic and other institutions that affect women's and men's lives and opportunities. And nothing in living memory has affected men's and women's lives and opportunities more than the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 pandemic is harming health, social and economic well-being worldwide, but with different implications for men and for women. Women are hugely overrepresented on the front lines against COVID, and the impact of the crisis on women is striking. Women are leading the health response. They make up almost 70% of the healthcare workforce force across the globe, exposing them to a greater risk of infection. They are similarly overrepresented in other essential services that remained open during the pandemic. At the same time, women are also shouldering much of the burden at home, given school and childcare facility closures and long-standing gender inequalities in unpaid work. Women also face high risks of job and income loss and face increased risks of violence, exploitation and abuse during times of crisis and quarantine. As we face the challenges of overcoming the global pandemic, there is a growing concern that years of progress in promoting gender equality and empowering women in the home and at work is perhaps being undone. So how do we ensure that policy responses to the crisis incorporate a genuine gender perspective and account for women's unique situations, needs and responsibilities? And as we continue the battle against COVID-19, what can we learn from the different experiences in Europe and in the Gulf to help in closing the gender gap in line with the commitments of the 2030 Agenda for uh, Sustainable Development. To help us to answer these important questions and more, we're delighted to welcome four very active and hugely experienced panelists today. And to begin with, it gives me enormous pleasure to introduce Dr. Mary McAleese. Mary was president of Ireland for 14 years from 1997 to 2011. She is a member of the uh, Bussery Institute's Honorary Advisory Board. Mary was appointed uh, as Reed Professor of Criminal Law, Criminology and Penology at Trinity College Dublin back in 1975. She later became Director of the Institute of Professional Legal Studies, Queen's University Belfast, and was appointed Queen's first Roman Catholic, the pro-vice chancellor in 1994. In 2018, she was appointed professor of children, law and religion at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And since 2019, Mary is also now chancellor of Trinity College in Dublin. I could go on because the list is never ending, but uh, that uh, would be my introduction, uh, to Mary, at this stage. And Mary, you're most welcome. Uh, by, to begin with, just maybe to ask you a kind of a general broad question, if we are to come out of the COVID crisis 
in a sustainable way. We're going to need to use all the human talent available. And based on your very wide experience, how can we promote women's meaningful participation in decision-making bodies and processes from the local right through to the national and international levels? Thank you very much indeed, John, and thank you to the audience who are here and to my co-panelists. It's um, good to be de dealing with this issue. And I suppose one of the things that occurs to me um, coming, um, looking now back on the last 15 months or 16 months of this pandemic and at the impact, as you mentioned, you uh, catalogued very well the impact on women in particular. It has impacted everybody around the world. Very few people have been um, left untouched by the impact of the pandemic. But what has been interesting has been the particular focus on women uh, that has managed to come to the surface. It's always been very difficult um, uh, to, in, uh, over these years uh, and decades, I think particularly in the European Union, where we really since the early 70s have had really a very significant focus on equal opportunities for women, on equal pay for women, on equal issues for women. Um, but um, over the years, we have noticed that you make progress, yes, but never enough. You get momentum and then it stops. It's stop, go, stop, go. And we never seem, seem to be able to break through um, those barriers, particularly the, the barriers that, that come from cultural longevity. These are, these are things that have been embedded in our histories and our stories and our way of looking at ourselves and our way of looking at each other in our laws. Um, and, and they have to, to, to unembed those, to, to try and get rid of those has proved really very difficult. I mean, I think you mentioned that I worked in Queen's University and when I worked there, one of the problems, two, we had two problems. Uh, one, that we didn't employ enough Catholics and secondly, that we didn't employ enough women. And we set about trying to redress those two things by retraining our staff, by making ourselves sensitive, each one of us sensitive to the baggage we carry, um, to the way in which we um, constantly prefer to be in the company of people who reflect back ourselves to ourselves. And, how, and, and also what a zero sum game that is, how you lose out on the benefit of just a wider how you, how you fail to galvanize all the talent that's there when you insist on doing that. Anyway, the bottom line is that we had great success. We, we retrained 3,000 staff um, in a really very detailed self-critiquing, um, uh, re, uh, like retooling of our culture. And we had great success with the Catholic thing, but we didn't have such great success with the women thing. Suddenly, our numbers and our statistics in relation to Catholics started to go up but the numbers of women remain stubbornly high. And what that taught me was the, 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 the Catholic Protestant thing only goes back 500 years to the Reformation. The women men thing goes back thousands of years, um, right through all the major religions and in particular through um, just through historic forces that we fail to see are still at work, still, still, you know, still shaping our minds and our mentalities. So anyway, um, I think that we really need now um, with the focus that is on women, and that's one of the good things that has come out of this. If, if anything good has come out of the darn pandemic, it has been the focus on women and the reality that women are the most impacted cohort. I mean, you said it yourself, they are, they make up the most of frontline workers um, in, the, in the healthcare services. They are exhausted. They, are, they were the people who were exposed to COVID. They are the ones left with the, um, with the burden of care for patients and for a healthcare system that in many countries was struggling to catch up with uh, the pandemic. They're also the people who bear, bear the burden at home, you know, with homeschooling, children at home, um, uh, elderly parents cocooning. Um, they were also the people who were likely to be in the sectors most affected by um, the sudden collapse of economies, the sudden stopping of economies. They were in the catering, the hotel, the informal sectors where people had part-time jobs that disappeared like snow off a ditch. They were the people who, they are the people who are in the essential services sectors who've had to work round the clock to keep supply chains, to keep the supermarkets going, to keep the shops that were entitled to use open, all of that. So, and they're also the people who have borne the burden of increased domestic tensions. I mean, people stuck for a year 
in tiny apartments looking after um, husbands, children, um, little income. And so we see this burgeoning problem of domestic violence. I mean, in the European Union, we know that 50 women a week die, a week die from domestic violence. And that says, that only gives you the, the, the top line figure, then all the, other, all the other episodes that never get into a statistic because people are too afraid or do not have because of the pandemic access to, um, to reporting. So look, um, there are, this, it seems to me when we come out of, as we come out of the, the, um, the pandemic, what we really have to do now is to galvanize the two wings that we have, the male, the female, get them really working, get them, get the elevation, the direction and the speed that comes from using the two wings that we were given by nature or by God for those who believe in God. We have to get them working. And the reason we have to get them working, one is justice, equity, equality. These are important elements of any, of the dynamic of any country that is, that has, you know, is, that respects human dignity, but we have lost so much momentum economically. We have lost so much momentum that has impacted women economically that we really need now new heft. And that heft has to involve women. It has to take women from the position they're in down the back of the queue and really fast forward. If we don't use this opportunity, if we waste it, then we'll all lose out again because the heft that we need to get our economies mobilized, to get life back, not just back to normal, but back to super normal in the sense that we've learned a lot. We want to distill that now. And we do not want to go back to the times when women were always down the back, down the queue. I saw, just to finish up with a, uh, the story that I saw the other day, it came in through my mailbox, you know, that says, you know, women, uh, men, aspire to the, you know, to the, to the well-paid jobs. They want to be doctors, lawyers, accountants, um, CEOs. And then it says women aspire to the lower paid jobs. They want to be female doctors, female lawyers, female accountants, and female CEOs. And that's the story of women. That even those who make the grade, even those who push through all those glass ceilings still find themselves with a level of disempowerment, under, underpaid, they, they find themselves still in an unequal space. And until we join together, men and women, and we have national strategies, local strategies, and international strategies, which interlock and work together to get women in the position for all their genius, all their talent, um, all their creativity, and their views and their opinions are working with those of our men so that humanity benefits from the two wings flying together. At the moment, um, it's appalling. One wing is broken, battered. And that's not good for humanity. And it's going to be a disaster if we leave it like that after the COVID crisis is over, because we really need, we need momentum. Thank you very much, Mary. That's a wonderful start. And now we'll move on to uh, Dr. Halla and to Esri. And Dr. Halla is the General Secretary of the Family Council, Ministry of Human Resources and Social Development in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Halla established the annual family conference in Saudi Arabia and worked on Saudi's national family strategy. She has represented the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women and in the International Labour Organization Committee on Violence and Harassment in the world of work for the past three years. Halla was chair of the G20 Women Empowerment Team during the Saudi G20 presidency in 2020. She also, among other things, a long list of things, has chaired the 39 Arab Women's Committee, the League of Arab States. Uh, and uh, you're extraordinarily welcome, Halla, today. It's great to have you. And my question to you, my initial question, again, a longish one, uh, just even before the pandemic, progress towards gender equality had been uneven, as I said at the beginning. Despite the progress in many areas over recent years, the situation of women and girls around the world remains of great concern, as Mary has been highlighting there. 
and much still needs to be done to equally include women and men in policy making and public governance. Going forward from the pandemic, as we move out of this pandemic, how can we make further progress, number one, and two, avoid losing the gains that have already been made? So if you can remember all of that now, over to you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Joan, and I'm really delighted and thrilled to be on this panel um, um, with the esteemed um, co-panelists here. So um, the situation in Saudi is a bit different from probably other countries around the world because the journey towards um, equity has only started um, five years ago, if we may say. Uh, with the Vision 2030, there was um, a comprehensive framework to um, um, reach um, the full empowerment of women, uh, equal access to all opportunities and um, you know, financial inclusion and all of that. So we started with this framework, we put numerical targets, we uh, amended the legislations, uh, did so much uh, changes in the legal infrastructure. Uh, and um, last year, unfortunately, that coincided with the pandemic, we were just starting to cultivate the fruits of that four years journey of uh, uh, women empowerment in the kingdom. So um, our main uh, objective was to make sure that we continue this project and that we are uh, not you know, digressed by the pandemic and mitigating all those challenges. So that was mainly our battle uh, in the past 16 months is to continue with the framework and not stop there. And Alhamdulillah, thank God we did. Uh, but if, if you look back um, at the gains and since they are recent gains uh, in terms of um, having a set a, a numerical target to increase women's participation in the labor market, this is what the vision says in one of its programs. But in order to achieve that, we had to work on all sides of women's lives. So you cannot um, push women to the labor market without making sure that uh, there are family friendly policies that help her take care of the children, do the care work, um, and also care for the elderly and so on, whoever she's responsible for as well. Uh, also, you cannot push women to the labor market without guaranteeing that there is equal access, uh, that she will have no glass ceiling, uh, equal pay, harassment laws, you know, all of these. It's, it's um, a comprehensive plan that we managed to work on over the past four years. So we, we started with the, with the legal framework and there we made sure that uh, necessary amendments to existing laws are made. So we revisited, for example, labor law, retirement um, uh, legislations. Uh, we also came up with the new, new laws like the anti-harassment law, for example. <clears throat> and then uh, we looked at, again, if there are issues with existing procedures, for example. And yes, we did find plenty of those and we also changed them uh, related to um, the um, labor environment related to women's rights, for example, mobility, travel, lifting the ban on driving as all the world has heard. And all of these um, issues, we needed to fix them so that when we um, um, open more opportunities for women in the labor market, when we remove <clears throat> uh, cultural barriers or whatever barriers are, there are, then we make sure that women will actually benefit from these. Because we, we've seen from other countries that sometimes you know, governments work in one direction, but the impact of that is, is not as expected. So we made sure that we cover the whole thing from all angles. And then the pandemic happened, <clears throat> like all other countries in the world. And um, we realized that um, all of, of that progress was great, but unfortunately, um, as, as mentioned earlier today, 
women work in the sectors that were mostly affected by the pandemic, SMEs, um, informal economy, tourism, hospitality. These are the sectors that were closed, unfortunately. Uh, so um, there were measures that needed to be taken at that time to make sure that the gains and those women that recently joined the labor market would not go out again. And then we will have to do the whole um, framework uh, from scratch and probably differently because of the economic changes that happened. Um, also, um, probably the one of the sectors that um, had women from, from um, the early 50s in the kingdom was the health sector. Uh, so they were at the front line. But the problem was that with that was that they had to um, either suffer from the consequences of dealing with um, uh, COVID-19 or financial because they couldn't go home. So they had to rent places to stay in. They had to find someone to take care of their families. So all of these were um, sudden, like uh, all countries faced all over the world, and we had to, you know, respond to them um, instantly. Uh, also, women who who worked uh, and had children at home learning um, online, uh, we had to change the um, school time so that um, the younger children will start school after three p.m. so that their mothers would have been back from work or finish the online, endless online meetings they had. So, um, you know, all of these measures were spontaneous, sudden, but I have to say that had there not been women at the um, policy making level in the kingdom, all of these challenges would not have surfaced and uh, no one would have paid attention to, to these problems. But due to the fact that over the past four years, the kingdom managed to bring women to leadership positions, uh, whether it's in the Shura Council, in leading positions in ministries, um, Ministry of Human Resources, and in other areas where women's voices were heard. And therefore, these issues were brought to the surface and were discussed, were addressed, and uh, were worked on, as I said, spontaneously. And we're still doing that all the time. And um, probably, hopefully, when the pandemic is over, we can look back retrospectively and see what, what did we do right, what did we do wrong. But currently, we are, even in the you know semi-recovery that we're experiencing now, we see that that effort is continuous. We have um, uh, um, a committee, a higher committee, that is always looking at these issues and problems in the kingdom uh, coming out of the pandemic. And we keep on presenting to that committee uh, any issues or problems that women are also um, facing. So and, and to conclude, I have to say that um, I consider it a success that we never stop working on our framework, even during the pandemic. Uh, that even um, last uh, last month we announced a new amendments to uh, the civil laws in the kingdom amid everything that was going on. That yesterday um, the um, crown prince announced the achievements of the first five years of the vision, and we see that we exceeded the targets that we have put for women's participation. With, we thought we would reach 25% uh, by 25. We've actually uh, reached 33% by 2025. So that's the gain that we are so um, proud of and we're clinging to. And we hope that um, with the pandemic or without the pandemic, as long as we have a leadership that believes in um, the progression of uh, women, the, the rights for women to have equal access, uh, that inshallah we are on the right track. Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much, Halif, for that very uh, open and frank description of indeed how things have changed uh, in, in the kingdom over the past five years or so. And indeed, much of that, I'm in no doubt whatsoever, is due to you and your colleagues and people like you working together. And you mentioned people in the Shura Council. We indeed have had uh, Hoda Al-Halasi, a member of Shura Council, 
uh, with us in a number of our, our webinars. So thank you very, very much. I move on now to uh, Dr. Noura, Noura, Noura Alamro. And Noura is a physician and a clinical epidemiologist. And she is Saudi Arabia's Consultative Assembly's first ever social and health policy fellow. She advises several Saudi ministers, including health, labor, social development, planning and economy, as well as the Quality of Life Programme 2020, one of Saudi, uh, Saudi Vision 2030 that Hala mentioned, realization programs. She is currently one of 13 women appointed by royal decree to serve on the Saudi Human Rights Commission Council's fourth term, 2020 to 2024. She is also an assistant professor of public health at the Department of Family and Community Medicine at the College of Medicine in King Saud University. And Dr. Noura also is the author, keep, to keep her busy, of a weekly column on contemporary social and health affairs for a major Saudi newspaper. And there are other things, they're the, the key ones. So I'll move over to you now, Noura, with your, your first question. And we'll, we'll kind of look at the recovery plans that should grow out of this pandemic. And the question I'd frame would be, we've been talking about the COVID-19 crisis and how it's harming health, social and economic well-being worldwide, with women at the centre, often overworked and undervalued. That has been something we've highlighted here this morning. How do we ensure, in your view, that women do not become even more marginalised in this situation and that governments will prioritize women in their recovery plans. Thank you, John, for having me today. And uh, it's truly an honor to be among uh, the esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, I think, um, um, as we've seen, um, COVID-19 pandemic is still uh, uh, um, uh, continue to affect uh, and challenge the, the world. Uh, so it's, it's very obvious that at this stage, there are discussions around recovery plans uh, in different regions, in different countries, uh, um, uh, unions. And it's, it's uh, very important now to have a strong gender lens uh, on response and, and recovery um, if needed uh, um, uh, to, to have a um, uh, to ensure the health, well-being, and dignity for all citizens. And really the GCC at this stage, together with the regional and global partners, are well, uh, is well positioned to start a discussion around such a framework for re recovery that integrates women empowerment uh, and its different components. Um, this call to action, meaning um, starting a discussion around a framework for COVID-19 recovery in the GCC uh, is, is, um, is very important and timely. And there are uh, um, emerging frameworks in different uh, areas around the world uh, where they're now talking about the intersection of women empowerment and uh, um, COVID-19 uh, recovery. And if you look at those different frameworks, you will see that there are three main domains that emerge every time. First is the leadership and meaningful uh, participation. Um, uh, it has been mentioned earlier by the esteemed panelists, uh, uh, the importance of leadership commitment, as well as the participation of women and girls in the decision-making process during the response. And now is very important during the uh, recovery plan. The second domain is really around physical and psychological safety. And uh, what we mean by that, to have the ability and capacity to really uh, prevent and mitigate, mitigate and respond to gender-based uh, violence. And I think Dr. Hala mentioned the national experience in Saudi Arabia where you had those services um, um, continue and it was a commitment uh, from the leadership as well as the executive branch of, of government to have them continue throughout the um, uh, uh, pandemic, during the lockdowns. It wasn't an easy process, but that was a, 
um, a commitment. And also the, the third uh, domain is around economic uh, well-being and welfare. And what we mean by that, that uh, girls and, and, and women uh, need to have a uh, continue their participation in economic activities and their employment and to have a um, the ability to really generate a sustainable income that they really have control over. So now if you look at the uh, GCC, there's really limited discussion around this. So um, you have national recovery plans, uh, people are talking each country, but I think it's really an opportunity to come together and see how can we put together a, a framework for recovery that takes into account the cultural and, and, and social context that we share in the GCC countries uh, with key principles and uh, success factors. Those principles uh, um, 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 are recurrent and you see them emerging with different frameworks. Um, um, they start by um, uh, gender mainstreaming, uh, uh, integration of, uh, of women um, in the emergency preparedness plans uh, and also for the recovery plans. So they need to be there for um, um, uh, the analysis, it needs to be a gender-based, uh, um, they need to be, they need to have a unique capabilities as well, where they uh, bring the issues, as Dr. Halle mentioned, and that what happened, at least in the Saudi context, that you had women sitting on the table. The importance of sex uh, uh, disaggregated data, it's very, very important. So you've seen all the dashboards of cases, uh, um, um, admissions, uh, sometimes the mobility data, labor data. Now it needs to have a gender lens uh, to, to inform the policy makers and the designers of different programs uh, that it's very important to have uh, uh, women there. Uh, also gender budgeting. So uh, you see the um, uh, financial responses to COVID um, um, and the discussion around them, they should have a gender uh, um, uh, responsive interventions uh, to take women into account in their differential uh, um, uh, needs. Strategic uh, um, partnerships. Uh, it goes without saying. We think that you know, it's uh, recovery usually is led by government, but you really need to par the participation of private sector, NGOs, uh, whether it's national or, or regional or even uh, uh, global. And I think it's uh, one of the most important things that I think Her Excellency Dr. Mary um, talked about this is really to document and share good practices. Uh, we have pockets of experiences. Some of them are uh, pockets of excellence. So we really need to have uh, those experiences shared. Uh, we hope today with the webinar is, is one platform where we share those experiences and learn from uh, each, each other because it's, it's very important to invest in, in, in COVID-19 recovery and also know that uh, most probably we'll be facing other uh, crises in the future and the other uh, pandemic. So this is not gonna be the last one. So we need to have um, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the gender lens uh, there to even reflect and um, uh, adapt accordingly. So just to sum it up, I think uh, with all the challenges that the, the world is facing, uh, it's, it's very important to go back into culture and context. And the GCC is really well positioned at this stage to start such discussion um, and take them to, um, uh, to really the next stage of uh, integration into strategies, uh, as mentioned before, whether it's the national strategy or regional or even global strategies uh, for COVID-19 uh, uh, recovery. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. And that is, again, a wonderful uh, addition to, uh, to um, uh, what we've been discussing this morning and looking at the way forward. And I'll come back to you again when we, we come back to further questions. You mentioned the possibility of other pandemics. In fact, it's the certainty, I'm sure, as we, we move forward. And I'll come back to you with another, maybe another little question on that. I'd like you to expand on it a little more. And we'll move now to our uh, final panelist, panelist, and that's Adia Ahmed Al-Sayed, uh, and she is the first female president 
of the Bahrain Journalists Association. So Adia, you're most welcome. Uh, Adia won a seat for the first time for Bahrain at the International Federation of Journalists Gender Council uh, with the aim to protect and defend female journalists' rights worldwide. Uh, Adia worked as media and international news advisor for the Ministry of Cabinet Affairs and the Ministry of Information in uh, Bahrain. And she has served as spokesperson for Bahrain's parliamentary and municipal elections in 2006. She serves on the board also of trustees of the Dubai-based Arab Women's Federation. During the past three decades, uh, Adia has worked in print media and hosted weekly radio and television programs discussing political issues, social change in Arab societies, and very importantly, women's rights. So Adia, you're most welcome. And I want to stay with the, you know, your role in journalism and uh, the media, and just maybe to ask you a question, despite all the challenges being faced by women during the pandemic, We've listed them this morning. Uh, their voices are still not always being sufficiently represented in the media. Does this run the risk of leaving their experiences and their expertise unheard, and maybe even their perspectives ignored uh, in the policy responses to the crisis? So over to you. Thank you very much, uh, John, for the introduction. I appreciate it. I hope I'm heard. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd like to thank Her Excellency Dr. McLeese for being with us here today. When a successful woman like her is joining this panel, I think it gives us a lot of support and it means a lot to us. Dr. Hala and Dr. Noura, you have been a pride for Saudi Arabia. You have a great conference and you're all moving forward. And we as Bahrainis can't wait for Vision 2030 to be achieved in Saudi because the success of Saudi women is a success for Bahrain's women too. Um, are women um, deprived of having a voice everywhere? I know that when you're sharing a story, if you have a bad story to share, it is better than having a good story to share. But I have to be fair about what is truly going on. This is a country where Women got educated since the 1950s and 60s, and they came back and they served as doctors, lawyers in different fields. And then uh, the country went through establishing its uh, infrastructure and becoming a modern state until the year 2000, when everything changed with a new constitution and a new leader as the king. Uh, when things changed, um, the king tried to uh, appoint women in position. Why was he doing that? Probably, to my knowledge or my explanation and interpretation, is that he was trying to tell Bahrain that these are the women who have been educated for years, and now it's their chance to show you what they have. After they got appointed, the elections started taking place. Women were appointed in the Shura Council, were appointed as cabinet ministers. In the first 2006 elections, when women had to vote, could vote, of course, since 2002. But when women decided to vote, they exempted women from seats and they gave women only one seat in the parliament. So women themselves didn't trust other women. And then things started changing. Every four years, there was an increase in the number of women appointed in the upper house and women who were, who were elected to the lower house. And then until 2018, when Bahrain proved to the world that we cannot, we do not only vote for women because we believe in them. No, parliament actually voted for a woman to become the head of the parliament. And this woman became the first head of the legislative authority in the country. So the story of Bahrain is a very good story. When the pandemic took place, many people believe that this part of the world is probably backward. Women are oppressed, women have no rights. I lo completely look at it in a different way. When the pandemic took place, yes, female and male doctors have been frontliners. But when I speak about journalists, I see that the newspapers, on the contrary, sent men to locations to cover the events where there were outbreaks. And if this says anything, it says that 
men in our workplace were protecting the woman. There, there wasn't a law saying that women shouldn't go to these places, but there is this culture of protecting women. And I think that this culture of protecting women and allowing women to work and to succeed is a very, um, is a very open-minded culture. Bahrain is not a backward state. If women choose to sit at home, they do, and they are well taken care of by their husbands and families. And that doesn't mean that they are being demeaned or anything. On the contrary, they are being well respected and taken care of. If women choose to work, no doors are closed to them. The pandemic actually had one benefit for women who are who have small and medium enterprises. We expected that these women are going to all go broke. What happened is that the government said, we are going to fund these projects, both men and women, so that they don't go broke and we don't want people to lose their jobs. What happened, these women had even more time because they had small businesses and they had their jobs. The jobs became places they cannot go to, so they invested into their businesses. People started buying things internally, locally made things. These businesses actually boomed during the pandemic. From every disaster, you can make a good story out of it. I think Bahrain did a good story out of it. The increase in the number of cases today, we dropped 250, 200. Today we are around 1,000. Why is there an increase? Simply because people got vaccinated, their first dose, and they felt good about it, and they felt they're safe, and then they started going out. And that's why the outbreak took place again. Now, the role of women at home is very important. Women are doing everything. Women are working, studying, and raising children at home. Do they deserve higher positions in society? Yes, they are in all careers. But as a woman, I have to and I need to fight for more leading positions for women. If we have one in the cabinet, we need five in the cabinet. If we have 10 in the Shura, I need to see 20 in the Shura Council. So this fighting for women rights will never end. But the whole country came together when we had a family law, a family law that was going to assure that women's rights after divorce is protected. Journalists, all the authorities in the country, the clergymen all stood, stood with the woman in order for this family law to be passed. And it got passed, passed and women's rights are more protected following divorce. Uh, journalists, Bahrain has, there has been a huge change in Bahrain. Journalists are now going to have a law that um, is against the imprisonment of journalists uh, due to, uh, due to um, publishing and privacy. No journalist is going to face imprisonment. Many changes are happening. Women are 50% of journalists in Bahrain. And this shows that they are also being given the power of being in the fourth state and having a voice to be heard. I hope that this was short and brief. My puppies are barking. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Adia. Don't worry about the puppies. It shows that we're live. So <laughs> there's no problem. Uh, Mary, uh, following all of that, and uh, even though, you know, maybe it went on, some of them a little longer, it's been brilliant. And we've got tremendous input over the last, uh, since we started. Mary, just pause maybe of your very wide experience in higher education to move away maybe and move towards youth. Uh, you, more than anybody else, will be aware that youth have faced many challenges because of COVID. Uh, how do you think we should support recent graduates, particularly women, in trying to enter the labour uh, market during uh, the uh, pandemic? Thanks, John. And I have to say, I've been fascinated to listen to the contributions from Saudi and Bahrain because they run counter, so strongly counter to image and stereotype. Yeah. And um, I think it's so important that the world hears the work that is being done, the championing that is happening, the laws that are changing, the culture that is moving. So thank you to all those who are doing that work um, and who have faith in it and who can show the outcomes. Um, our young graduates have had a really tough time of it, um, particularly those who are coming into the labour force this year, many of whom did not get the university experience that were the college experience that we would have wished for them. They have been studying online, they've been sitting in bedrooms, they haven't had the social, they haven't had the social side of university. 
um, they haven't had the experience that many of us as, that remember with great fondness, even though, even though my memories go back a very long way. But nonetheless, the memory of that liberation of being a student, of being an adult, and of starting to put the pieces of the jigsaw, the early part of the jigsaw puzzle of your life together. And these early days, these early, um, this movement into workforce is going to be so very, very important. And many of them are asking themselves now, well, where am I going to go? How am I going to slot in? What they're looking at is at the moment, mass unemployment. Um, that cohort of young people are the ones who are currently most affected by the unemployment, which is a direct effect of the pandemic. Here in Ireland, for example, before the pandemic, we had we had arrived at almost full employment, which for us was a you know a, a wonderful a magical phenomenon, um, giving such huge uh, energy um, not just to our economy but to our lives because it created opportunity, and with the opportunity comes the confidence, and the confidence is a really important thing for women in particular. Um, uh, what we don't want to happen is as the economy uh, opens up that this generation of young people coming out of college, that they lack confidence now in themselves because so much that they would have taken for granted fell away. One of the things I would be saying to them, and I said it the other day to our, our graduating law students in Trinity is, you know, they, they, how they adapted to the pandemic, um, you know, adapting to the kitchen table as their classroom, adapting to the lack of sociability, um, making the best of it, making the best of online teaching for those who still, and the, the majority were on online teaching, not everybody was fortunate to be still in clinics um, or in clinical courses where they, were, where they still had the university life experience. So even that was limited, no cafes, no pubs, no socializing, you know, so all of them had very limited lives. And I think the important thing now, um, as we come out of that is for them to be told how proud we are of what they achieved in getting through this god awful year, um, and how they and, and how the skills that they had to bring to bear, the creativity they had to bring to bear on adapting, that these are not lost to them. Um, they they have now got sets of resilience, um, internal resilience. They also had to cope with really with fairly significant, I would have thought, mental health issues that other generations did not have to face into. Um, and so uh, I think that we have to look at them and say, hang on a minute, don't see yourselves as people who have lost out on something that we acknowledge that you did, but you have also embedded in yourselves now gains that are going to be very, very useful. We need resilient people as we go forward. We need people who are going to be infinitely adaptable. Nora's point is well made. We don't know what's ahead of us. There could be another pandemic, another mutation, another variant that we can't cope with coming down the line. So we need people who are able to say, yeah, I've been, I know how to cope with this. I know what we need to do. Um, who are able to say, because we weren't able to say this to our children. We were looking at this going, what do we do? Because we didn't know we were going into this blindfolded and just struggling our way through it. Now we've got a generation who've been through it and um, who've lived with all sorts of restrictions and have lived, for the most part, lived well with them, you know, accepting them, adapting to them who've shown remarkable generosity of spirit in the doing of that and stoicism. So I think these things are bankable and they're particularly bankable in as we go forward. And as, and as Nora says, we don't know what's ahead of us. There could be another pandemic coming down the line. So, so these are young people who have to be told, you know what, you really are quite exceptional now. You're an exceptional generation. And um, as the marketplaces start to open, their talents and their skills are going to be surely needed. I mean, here in Ireland, for example, all the indicators are that as soon as the pandemic restrictions are lifted, our economy is set to take off. It's young. It's the most educated in the world, um, highly educated. It's, um, it's ready to go. And so we will need these young people to believe that even just for these, these months in which we are still restricted and which things are still locked down, closed down, and the future still has that, that element of instability about it, that they, please goodness, as the economies start to open up, they will find opportunities. And the thing to say to them is, take whatever opportunities are going, don't wait for perfection. None of any of us in the workplace, you know, going back the last 50 years, we know, 
you don't wait around for perfection. You, you, you make a start, you jump in and you use whatever opportunities are available to you to grow in skill and confidence and ability to make your mark, to showcase your abilities, but also to learn from the others around you in that marketplace who are there a lot longer and who have skills and wisdom to impart. So I think really mentoring our young people, creating great opportunities for internships, for skills sharing, but also I think this is just one of the most important things we can say to them. Don't regard yourselves as people who have lost something. Regard yourselves as people who are pioneers, who pioneered new ways of being in the instant, in the moment. People who were confronted with just an extraordinary set of circumstances and suddenly had to adapt. And they did and they got through their exams and they studied in the most awful of circumstances. I mean, imagine not leaving a house maybe for months on end um, and you know, studying on your own and not having, just not having even the relief of a cup of coffee with a friend you know, to, to chew the cud. Um, I think we are dealing, actually, you know, I think that we're dealing with an exceptional cohort of young people coming out into the marketplace now. Um, and coming out into our societies and into our cultures and their voices are going to be important. And that's the other thing we need to do is give them their voice. Let them tell us, let them tell us what they're made of and what they've learned during these times. And I said that to them the other night, you know, you're, um, they're, they've been exceptional. They've actually been exceptional. So accepting, and, and I made this point, they haven't been passive. There's a big difference between being patient and passive. They haven't been passive. They have patiently accepted what has happened, but they have also been um, you know, chew chewing, you know, champing at the bit, ready to get going. And their patience, I think, um, we have to repay their patience with giving them voice. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, Halle. Uh, let me move on and ask you a question uh, at the other extreme is about childcare. Uh, I, I know that uh, across the world at the moment, as a result of various measures <clears throat> that are being taken to address the pandemic, <clears throat> the OECD and others are reporting that 76% of mothers with children under 10 are saying that childcare is one of their top challenges during COVID-19. Uh, very briefly now, because we have less than 10 minutes, maybe how can we better support working mothers? In your view? Well, um, that's true. I mean, being a mother myself, I can tell you that you know, childcare was one of the real challenges. Now we're talking about uh, physical challenges. Simply, where do working mothers leave their children when they go to work? Uh, or even working mothers who are working from home and their children are studying online at the same time also face a challenge. So uh, yes, uh, the first thing we did here was reopen um, child care services. Uh, those centers uh, could be managed, um, precautions um, could be taken, but these are very necessary and we cannot keep them closed. So the first thing we did after you know, the numbers went down a bit was reopen the childcare uh, centers. Um, also, we have uh, provided um, several um, uh, campaigns um, on helping parents um, to manage the online learning experience. A we did walk into this blindfolded. I mean, as parents, we usually send our kids to school, but we don't know what happens there. And now when the school moved into our houses, we started to take in the roles of the teachers, uh, uh, the principals, I mean, name it. So we, we, we found ourselves in this situation where we didn't know what to do and um, we were not ready for it. So in, in the Family Affairs Council, this is one of the things we did is uh, we did provide uh, free training sessions online, um, uh, campaigns on how do you manage the situation, uh, starting from how do you arrange the space, time, uh, how do you do you follow your child's uh, education online and all of that? Also, one very important issue is um, family counseling. 
um, many challenges came out uh, of, of this lockdown experience where people are in too much contact all the time and there are things that we've never experienced before. So uh, we did also the service of online counseling that is open for parents, uh, children, and even you know um, any any individual who has an issue with uh, family members. So um, we managed to reach out to uh, the families through these um, digital services. Uh, we also found it very crucial to reopen the uh, daycares. But um, did we did we find solutions that magically ended the issue? I don't think we did. I think it's still a pressing issue. I think um, that's why when when revisiting any laws related to um, labor or uh, retirement or anything, we need to again focus very much on childcare. And also when we look at women's empowerment, and this is one of the issues that we put um, clearly in the um, G20 uh, uh, recommendations is that it's, it's not a joke. We are not childcare, unpaid care is, is real. And it is something that is really affecting women and it should be you know, at the surface of uh, any discussion of women empowerment all around the world. Thank you very much, Hala. And now, Nora, I said that I'd come back and ask you about the role of women in ensuring resilience for the next potential pandemic. But maybe, maybe another one might even be better at this stage. I would say just to go back to, um, say, vaccination programs and reluctance to accept vaccinations and so on. What is the role of women, we'll say, in ensuring that their families and the community generally have confidence in the vaccination programs? So that, that's an excellent question, actually. And I love this question because it's, uh, for me, it's really um, uh, fascinating when I see people talk about vaccination uh, uptake and trust in vaccination, uh, while the evidence uh, um, shows that women make the majority of healthcare decision for their families uh, around the, the globe. Uh, so uh, in some studies, they show that they um, make up to 80% of healthcare decisions for uh, their children and, and family members and loved ones. So knowing this um, and not really uh, empowering women to make informed decisions, uh, uh, around uh, uh, vaccination uh, is 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 something um, uh, is mind-boggling, and I'm not sure um, uh, where is this coming from. But we need to work around this. So when we talk about empowering women to make informed decisions around uh, uh, vaccination, uh, uh, this uh, means that you need to work around the messaging. So um, you need to emphasize the safety of the vaccine. Uh, address their concerns. Uh, many women uh, um, are in childbearing age and they're very concerned as well uh, um, um, uh, about um, uh, taking the vaccine or um, advising uh, a fellow pregnant uh, lady or potentially uh, to be pregnant lady to take the vaccine. So uh, I think going back to uh, uh, Adia's uh, point around the presence of uh, women as well in media is very, very important because they would actually bring this lens where in the, in the um, uh, key messages and tailoring of messages and, and so on and so forth. And we've seen it uh, in, in, in many um, 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 examples and previous pandemics where actually women um, uh, were the major driver of getting the uh, vaccine out there campaigns. So once you have them uh, well informed, then um, you got uh, successful uh, vaccination campaigns. And I think that's, that's very critical. So building on, on the vaccination narrative, uh, that takes us to the whole kind of uh, building resilience and the role of women in the next pandemic. So you need to have women at the heart of any planning. Um, um, personally, and I obviously I might be biased, but if you go back to the context of GCC, I think Saudi is really well positioned to lead this kind of, you know, 
building consensus, building a framework around recovery plans, because we had really, um, uh, I would say, successful journey in COVID response. Uh, and even in a simple um, 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 measure such as the optics. So the first uh, person to be vaccinated in Saudi Arabia was a elderly Saudi female. And there was a reason behind this when they brought her to the TV. It wasn't just, you know, let's get the nearest elderly woman and get her vaccinated. It was to send a message and signal the whole system that women are very important and they are the key driver for making health decisions. So um, I think it's, it's um, uh, very important to have this in mind uh, and build the whole um, uh, kind of planning and recovery planning around this. Thank you so much. I wish we had more time. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. But as I said at the beginning, and I mentioned to maybe each one of you when we spoke yesterday, I see another webinar in this. And I see maybe even more than one. So we will come back to this, uh, I promise you. But I know I promised people and we always try and stick to the, the one hour only. And we've, we have a number of busy people with us today. So all that remains for me at this stage is to thank you. And uh, on behalf of Bosula, on behalf of our directors, uh, my very, very special thanks to Mary, to Noura, to Hala and Adia. I'm really so thankful to you for your brilliant contributions uh, to today's uh, uh, webinar. It, it's, for me, it's one of the best, and I've been involved in all of them. This is our 16th webinar since the, the lockdown started. And uh, for me, today has been, has been stunning. So thank you for sharing your views. And as Mary said, for, particularly in relation to uh, Saudi and Bahrain, for pointing to the progress that's being made in a relatively short number of years, but tremendous progress. I really, really do appreciate the time that each one of you invested in, in today. I'm also very grateful to all of our guests, and we have quite a number uh, who have joined us today for attending the webinar, and we look forward very much to seeing all of you soon again. I also, of course, want to finally to thank all of my colleagues at Bussola for their ongoing commitment and for their support. So thank you all very, very much. And I'm so sorry that we've run out of time. Uh, stay safe and take care. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Goodbye.